Good morning and welcome to our services here at the Euphoria Church of Christ. It's great to have you with us. I hope you've had a great week. You were able to enjoy and celebrate the holidays with your friends, with your family, however you were able to safely do so. And now we're certainly honored to have you with us as we worship our God together. We're going to have a couple of songs. We'll have our worship service. Uh, we're going to have a scripture reading by my boy Mason. He's going to be doing it for us today. And then we'll conclude our services this morning with the Lord's Supper. Thank you once again for being with us. God bless you. is today 1st Corinthians 9 verse 24 do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one gets the prize run in such a way that you may get it
Good morning and welcome to our services here at the Upora Church of Christ. It is good to have you with us. I am honored that you have taken the time to join in with us to continue to worship our God as we have been so blessed to do here at the Upora Congregation. And uh, we are happy to have you with us. I hope you've all had a great holiday season uh, <laughs> in whatever fashion that looked like. I know it was obviously a very different year. Um, it was for my family as well. So I hope you were able to enjoy the holiday season uh, best you could. And yet now here we are, we're staring down uh, just a few more days to the end of the year, to the start of a new year. It's hard to believe that this year is already over. It, it's unbelievable. It seems like we're now in the seventh month of April. Uh, and just, It's just it's certainly not December. It just I was thinking about it some today, and it is mind-blowing that we're here already, that we're already at the end of another year. So given what this year has looked like, and I guess I should just say we made it. We made it to the end of 2020. But I'm also very conscious of the fact that there are many that can't say that, that for, for that, that particular family, it's not the case. So I'm very conscious of that fact. Think about this past year in your own life. What, what did it look like for you? Did you meet the goals you set for yourself? Did you stick to those New Year's resolutions that you so valiantly and ambitiously set for yourself? Did you spend time growing in your faith and working on your, your Christian walk? Was that a focus for you throughout this past year? Because, and I want this point to be clear, and I hope to make this point as we go throughout the lesson today, you have traded an entire year of your life for what's now left in its place. An entire year is gone. So with the final days of the year remaining, and with an opportunity to uh, spend some time in self-reflection, what did you trade for it? What did you trade a year of your life away for? I grew up staying with my grandparents a good bit. The, the members here at Upor have heard me talk about them a lot. I'm very close to my grandparents. And I would stay with them a good bit, especially during the summers, uh, and, and work with my grandfather. I think he would just tolerate me more than anything. But I, I was raised in part by them, a big part by them. So I was raised a big Alabama fan, which is what they are, Alabama football. And something I remember uh, always hearing about Coach Bear Bryant for the Crimson Tide is that he would always carry this poem with him in his wallet. It was a poem by an unknown author, but I want to read for you what this poem said because it's very fitting for us in a time of reflection. This quote said this, This is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use it as I will. I can waste it or I can use it for good. What I do today is very important because I am exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever. Leaving something in its place, I have traded for it. I want it to be gain, not loss, good, not evil, success, not failure, in order that I shall not forget the price that I paid for it. There are a lot of changes that took place in just a short year. Uh, I would say we'd agree with that. I remember going into 2020 so optimistic so upbeat and happy-go-lucky, and boy, if I'd have known them, what I know now. There were a lot of first times for people this year. There were a lot of last times for people this year. So stop and think about it for just a moment. What did you trade away a year in your life for? And I, I know it's been challenging. I understand it's been very challenging on many fronts, but... Have you been able and are you going to be able to finish this year strong? Did you meet the goals you set for yourself? Were you, are you now where you hoped that you would be at this point? So with all that in mind and this idea of looking at the importance of finishing strong, finishing this year, finishing the race of our life, we're going to focus on that some more with the title of today's message and the end is near. And it's not just about finishing the year. It's not just about finishing and meeting some goal you set for yourself. But it's about striving in this race of life to win. So turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 12 for a moment. 
Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at the first couple of verses there this morning, which really when you get to Hebrews chapter 12, the first couple of verses belong at the end of Hebrews chapter 11 because it's really a continuation of what you would read going through chapter 11. But nevertheless, here it is in 12. So let's look at just the first two verses, Hebrew 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12 starts off with the word, therefore. Now, we know, and we've been taught years and years and years now, that when you see the word, therefore, you need to stop and ask yourself, what is there? What is it there for? So as I've mentioned already, this ties us back into Hebrews chapter 11, a chapter full of people, not perfect people by any stretch of the imagination, but faithful people that walked in the Lord. Now, these people, these heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, they knew something that was very important. And I hope to make this point clear to you today. They knew it was not how you started the race of your life that mattered. Because we all start our race, our Christian race, the faith race, at different points in our life and with different circumstances. What really matters in that aspect is that we start the race. That's what really matters. But we all start at very different places. They also recognized it's not so much about the bumps along the way. Those bumps that are there, they'll, they'll help you in the long run. But it's not really about them. They knew this, and it's a very important fact, that it's how you finish the race that matters. And these people that we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 11, they were persecuted for their faith even facing death, and they faced it with great courage. So the Hebrews writer tells us this, since you are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, well, the witnesses are, of course, those who we're talking about in chapter 11, those faithful ones that set the example. Now, that's not to say there's a literal you know, window in heaven and these witnesses are staring down at you. That Scripture doesn't support that, so that, that's not what I believe this is talking about. But this is talking about the faithful ones that have set this example for us now. Since we are surrounded by what they did, run your race. Run your race. Throw off the weight that's there slowing you down. The weight itself may not be sinful. But it is certainly hindering you in your obedience in your walk to the Lord. But the Hebrew writers continues. It says, also, throw off the bondage of sin. Well, this bondage of sin does nothing but trap you and ensnare you. It is only purpose, whereas many people may view this sin as fun and exciting and exhilarating, the purpose of this sin is to trap you. That's what it's there for. And you think about how many people carry this sin in their life, and they carry it with them from year to year to year. And they're surprised when nothing ever seems to get better. Nothing ever seems to change. They only seem to struggle time and time and year and year and so on. But the Hebrews writer gives us a message. It gives us the answer. It's not going to get better. It's not going to get better. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but if your choice is to never lay down the weights that drag you down, never to put aside the sin that separates you from God, it's not going to get better. You will continue to struggle each and every day and every year. That's what sin does to us. It seems fun in the short run, but its weight is heavy and the outcome is deadly. We are running a race, the writer says. And I think the idea of a race is a very fitting analogy for us to understand. Uh, I'm not a runner. That might be a surprise to some of you that I do not like to run. You might could tell that just by simply looking at me. But I think about someone like Usain Bolt when I think about runner. That's just my generation. That's what comes to mind, Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world. It's something truly incredible 
to watch him race and to watch him run. He's trained and he's worked and he has perfected his craft. He really has. What if I took Usain Bolt, fastest man in the world, and I strapped about 200 pounds to his back and I put him out on the track and I said, okay, now go win the race. Go match your world record now. Would he still be able to do it? Would he be able to win every race? No. No, he wouldn't be able to do it. It wouldn't be a fair race, would it? And you know what? You would be exactly right if you were thinking that. It would not be a fair race. He can't be who he is and do the things he needs to do to be successful with all of this stuff dragging him down and weighing him down. So why then, if we can recognize something like that, why then would we handicap ourselves and our Christian race and our Christian walk the same way? Why would you make your walk that much harder? It doesn't make good sense. We get into our faith race, and it seems like things are going so well for a short while, for just a little while, and then they're not. Something happens, and they're not going well. Something makes us stumble. It could be any number of things that you could look at. It, it might look like Abraham that we've talked about in great detail in our Bible study on Sunday mornings, leaving the promised land, and he, or he, he comes into the promised land, I should say, but then he leaves the promised land, and he goes to Egypt, and he lies to Pharaoh about it, and he doesn't worship God. It could look like that. It could look like David enjoying the cool night sky until he looks across and he sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof, and instead of turning away and, and leaving the situation, he lingers. And we know what follows from there. See, in both of those two accounts, these men were wrong. These men made mistakes. And in fact, we could spend a great deal of time talking about their failures. As I, I say Christians, but we know the term Christian wasn't around then. God-fearer. But the important thing when it comes to these two men is they didn't stay there. See, it's how you finish they didn't stay there. They didn't keep looking back to where they were. Instead, they were focused on where they were going instead. That's the, that's the difference. That is what matters. When you watch an Olympic race on TV, and I know I'm using a race analogy a lot, but I think it's very fitting. When you watch an Olympic race on the TV, where are the runners looking? Are they looking down at the track while they're running? They may look down when they start, but are they looking down at the track while they're running? No, they're not. Are they looking at the other runners? Well, they may glance side to side to see who's around them, but they're not looking at the runners. Are they looking at the fans to see who's, who's cheering them on? Is that what they're saying? No. They are looking at the finish line. They are looking at the point they are trying to get to in their race to have made it, to have possibly won. That's where their focus is. These two men, Abraham and David, the two examples I've mentioned already, these two men are listed in our Heroes of Faith section. Well, we just talked about their sin and their failure, but yet they're mentioned as heroes, this great cloud of witnesses. And I can't emphasize this point enough and strong enough for you today. It is not about how you got into the race. It's not about the bumps along the way, what matters is how you finish the race. We all have a past. We all have a past in some form or another. We wish we could change. We wish we could do differently. Or that I just wish wasn't there. I'm, I'm chief amongst people that believe that and wish that. You can't win your race by constantly looking behind you and looking back. I want you to notice something that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to Philippi. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Paul wrote this, and I think it's very fitting for our conversation today. Verse 13, he wrote, Brethren, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one, th one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which lie ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the same Saul of Tarsus that was hunting down Christians. 
Same guy. Do you think he ever had any regrets about his past? Paul didn't forget his past. None of us really forget our past. What he did do was he stopped letting the past overshadow his present and ruin the hope of any future. See, well, Paul said that he was forgetting those things. They're, they're behind him now. He says he's forgetting them. That means he's not going to carry them with him any longer. He's not going to carry them around like this weight, this weighted vest if I wanted to strap it to this runner over. He's not carrying it around. Instead, he's focusing on the things that are in front of him now. That's where his emphasis is going to be. In both cases, in fact, Hebrews chapter 12, as we read in the very beginning, Philippians 3 that we just read now, uh, they're striving for the same prize. That's what they're looking ahead to. Just as a runner is looking ahead to the finish line, in Hebrews 12 and Philippians 3, the prize is the same. The Hebrews writer said, I'm running the race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author, the author and the finisher of our faith. What Paul just said in Philippians chapter 3 is he's pressing toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All points begin with Christ and all points end with Christ. That's the start line and the finish line of our faith. So the first thing I want you to take away from the message today is this. I want you to know what the race is truly going to be like. This Christian faith race here. Because the use of a race is, is a metaphor to visualize the challenge. This is very common in the New, New Testament to describe things with these metaphors. Uh, we find things like put on the whole armor of God. So then we visualize a soldier. In fact, <clears throat> when you talk about this section in Scripture, especially in, in youth class, you see a soldier there. And he's dressed in his whole body of armor. So we visualize then a soldier that is preparing for battle. It helps us to understand it. We find in the Scripture that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers of darkness. As a, as a young kid, I was a fan of wrestling. So I, I visualized this in my mind, that we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. We're referred to as the bride in Christ, as the bridegroom. See, we have a lot of these things, this type of language in the Bible. And now we're reading about a race, this idea of a faith race that has a prize. So by now, if you've been around me any length of time, you know that I've come to enjoy, enjoy, and I have for some time now, word studies. So I was looking a little closer at the word here used for race in Hebrews chapter 12. Run with endurance the race that is set before you. So I wanted to know more about that specific word for race. The word there used for race in the Greek is agona. From this Greek word, we get our English word agony. See, that's not what I had in mind when I start thinking about my Christian walk. Is it for you? Is that what you think about when you think about your Christian walk, agony? This race is an agonizing and grueling course that's meant to knock you off path. That's what it's trying to do. It's a challenge that so many people in their life will, will not finish the course. They're not going to finish the race. See, this tells us, Agona tells us, it's not a Sunday stroll with a cool breeze in your face. It's not a casual walk along the beach like we might hope it is. If you're gonna finish the if you're gonna finish strong and you're gonna push on to win, my friend, it's going to take endurance. Look back over the year that we've had since it is drawing to a close here in just a few days. Was it easy? For many people, it wasn't. It was not easy. Many people lost their jobs. Some people lost their belongings, lost their livelihoods. And many lost family members. It's a year that many people threw their hands up in the air and said, I, I'm just not even going to try. I'm ready for this year to be over with. I'm done. I, I, it's over. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try. It's easy to lose our focus and our purpose in a time like this. Because this sounds like the definition of agony. 
And that doesn't even include all of those people that were struggling going into this year and going into a pandemic and going into something as uh, drastic as what we've been dealing with this year. So it's easy to stop and ask ourselves, what's the point? What's the point? Yes, the end is near, the end of the year. The end is near. Does it even matter? What's, why am I even worried about finishing strong? But I want you to understand this. There's a great opportunity for all of us in the midst of troubling times. It's in these times when so many will throw their hands up in the air and say, I'm done, that our faith is made the strongest. If you have faith, then you have hope. That's something the holiday, that's something Christmas helps to remind us of. That if we have faith, we have hope because hope came in the form of a baby born, born of a virgin. We, we've talked about that over the last couple of weeks. And because we have hope, we can run the race and we can finish strong. But don't get confused about what kind of race it's going to be. If you're looking for the easy stroll, this isn't it. The second thing I want you to remember is it's how we finish the race that matters, how we finish. Because as I've mentioned, this analogy of the race is, it beautifully articulates what we're talking about here with a Christian walk. When you watch a race on TV, either you know your local school, the Olympics, whatever it may be, how many people are on the race track at one time? Six to 12, depending on the size, the event, all of those kind of things. Six to 12 averaged out. Can all of them win the race? Well, no, of course not. That sounds silly to think about, doesn't it? Only one can win the race. So I want to go back to our scripture reading, and I want to expand on our scripture reading that Mason read for us a little bit ago. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 24 through 27. I want to build on this idea of running the race, but why? Why are you willing to do that? And so I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, you might be surprised to hear this, uh, but there are those that enjoy running, just to run. Um, I'm not sure what's wrong with the people that want to do that. Uh, in fact, you see me running, the old Joe, you see me running, you, you better run too. Something's coming. But in this race being described here, these runners aren't running just for fun. These runners are running to win. Paul even goes on, he uses the analogy of a boxer. He says, I'm not simply beating the air. If he's doing it, he is doing it for a purpose. He is doing it for a reason. But let me ask you this. Are you going to win everything you do? No, not likely so. But do you understand what the Apostle Paul is saying here? Because it is of the utmost importance. The issue is not that we win everything. The main point is that when you run this faith race, you run it with the intention of winning it. That's why we're doing it. We run our race with purpose with a goal in mind, with a finish line that we're staring at Jesus Christ. That is our finish point, the same starting point when we entered into the body of Christ. We're not aimlessly and hopelessly, as so many others are, out living our lives and doing the things that, that they do. They are seeking nothing more than a perishable crown, nothing more than the glory from worldly people. That's, that's what they're after, certainly not from God. That's like a runner on a treadmill that's going nowhere. That's what they're like. Why are you in 
the race today? Why are you in the faith race that you're in right now? What made you decide to obey the gospel? What made you decide to give your life over to Jesus Christ? What is it that keeps you going? But I'll tell you what, let me ask it in a different way. Has it been easy? Have there been struggles along the way since you gave your life to Christ? I would say probably so, at least for most people. Does that mean then, since you've had some struggles, does that mean you're going to just throw your hands up and say, I quit, I'm not interested in finishing the race? For many people it does. That's exactly what they do. For others out there today that maybe haven't given their life over to Christ, why aren't you in the faith race yet? What is it exactly you're waiting for? Is it an understanding problem? You just, you're not clear on what God expects from you. Is it an unwillingness to lay down the weights and the sins that the Hebrews writer was describing for us in chapter 12? See, when the Apostle Paul says that only one person can win the race, when we think about a race in the light that we view races today, you're, that's exactly right. There is one winner and a bunch of losers. That's what that signifies to us. Faith is different. See, in faith, all those who run the race, and importantly, those who finish the race faithfully, then they receive the prize. But you can't run the race from the sidelines. You have to be in the race. To be in the faith race today, you have to be in the church because the church is the body of Christ. So you can't run, much less win the race, from the sidelines. So the final thing this morning, I want to encourage you to finish the race strongly. To finish strong. In the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, he spent his time encouraging a young preacher, a young man that he had come to grow close with and care very deeply for. We can see their relationship throughout the text. And he writes to, Th to Timothy, uh, his second letter to Timothy, about many important matters, many things. But it's how he ends his final chapter of his final letter that I believe tells us everything that we need to know about the man. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Turn over there if you will. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. It's a passage I imagine you're familiar with. But I want you to listen to what he's telling his young protege. Verse 6, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not me also, but to all who loved his appearing. The same man, the Apostle Paul, beaten and left for dead, thrown into prison countless times, rejected and persecuted by his one-time friends, says this. He says, I have finished the race. He didn't just say, I ran the race. He said the important part, I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Does that mean he was perfect? Well, no, when we talk about Saul of Tarsus, you know he wasn't perfect. And in fact, as Paul, the Apostle Paul, he needed encouragement a few times along the way. So the Apostle Paul was by no way saying, listen, I'm perfect. But he always kept his eyes on the prize. And he says, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What's stopping you from doing the exact same thing? What's stopping you from being exactly like the Apostle Paul? You see, I, I think about a passage like Galatians 6, verse 7, when the Apostle Paul, again, he, he told this to Galatia. You were running well. You were doing good. Things were looking up for you. Who hindered you? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Galatians 6, verse 7. Who is it that got in your way? <coughs> Excuse me. Do you know the one that gets in the way most often is yourself? It was certainly the truth for me for many years of my life. I was my own worst enemy so many of the time. But you have to remember, that word for race is agony. 
It's not going to be easy. If it were easy, wouldn't everybody want to do it? If it were fun by what the world views as fun, would everyone want to do it? Jesus said this, and I'm going to make a couple of remarks here in closing. Jesus said this, difficult is the path and narrow is the gate that leads to life. And guess what? Few will enter in there by it. Now, the majority, on the other hand, well, they're not interested in that. They don't want any part of that because it doesn't sound fun. They want the wide path of sin, of destruction, damnation. That's what they're after. They're running their race with their eyes fixated on perishable things. Now, my question is, is that you? Does that describe you? Or are you running the race, as the Hebrews writer says, and as the Apostle Paul says, with your, your sights focused on Jesus Christ? Your sights focused on the prize, the author and the finisher of our faith, of our salvation, the one that loved you enough to take your place on the cross. But you see, it's a race of endurance. But in this race of endurance, the prize is something so incredible. A crown of righteousness awaits you. Being in the presence of the most holy and high God awaits you. That's why I'm running my, way, my race to win it. To be like the Apostle Paul to say, I finished my race. I kept the faith. And now I know what prize awaits me now. If you're not a child of God, well... Why are you waiting? Why would you put off something so important and so big and keep just waiting? And I recognize that we're remote right now. I know I'm looking at an empty room, and it's, it's awkward, I know. But we at the Poor Church of Christ would love to help you in any way we can, whether it's the prayers of the congregation. I know a lot of folks more than willing and happy to pray for you. Or maybe you're ready to obey the gospel and begin your faith race, which begins with Jesus Christ. Whatever we can do, please reach out to us and let us know, and we would be more than happy, more than glad to help in any way we can. Thank you all for being with me today. I appreciate your time and your attention. We're going to have one more song here in just a moment, and then we will partake of the Lord's Supper, the great blessed opportunity we have as Christians to commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you once again. I hope you all have a fantastic week and a safe New Year's. God bless you all. Bye, everybody. great blessing it is we have as children of God to take this time that we have set aside on the first day of the week to both celebrate and commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to 
partake of this Lord's Supper with us at this time now. Will you bow with me, please? Our most high and gracious Father in heaven, we give our thanks for this bread. To us as Christians, this bread represents the body of Jesus Christ that willingly laid down His own life on our behalf on Calvary's cross. I pray, Father, as we take of this emblem, that we do so in a manner that's well-pleasing to thy sight and according to thy word. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Will you bow with me once again, please? Once again, Father, now we give thanks for this fruit of the vine. To us as Christians, this represents the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that was shed on Calvary's cross as our Lord was suspended between the heaven and the earth. And the same blood that washes us clean of all of our sins. As we partake of this emblem, may we do so in a manner well-pleasing to thy sight. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Uh, I do want to go ahead and offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the blessings of this life that we've had uh, in what would normally be our collection, uh, but I do want to uh, offer this prayer of thanksgiving. So bow with me one final time, if you will. Our Father, now our prayers turn to that of thanksgiving for all the physical blessings of this life that you've given us, the ability to earn and provide for ourselves, for our families. And Father, I pray we always recognize these blessings come from you. At this time now, Father, we uh, offer our, our prayers and our blessings of the collection that's given to the continuation of the services here at the Upora Church of Christ, that we use those funds to continue to spread your gospel throughout this community. I pray that we search our hearts and do so in a loving manner. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We will.